Hi, I'm Judge Thomas J. Munley of the Court of Common Pleas of Lackawanna County. Welcome to the revised edition of North Penn Legal Services Custody and Visitation Video Workshop. The purpose of this video is to provide basic information about how a child custody dispute may be handled by the courts or through negotiation or mediation. In the next 30 minutes or so, we will define some of the key terms such as legal custody and physical custody. We will also examine some of the factors parents must consider in deciding whether or not to file a petition for custody. We will then look at several common situations involving child custody. Finally, we will describe what happens over a petition for custody once it's filed. Where do you file the papers? When is the hearing? What happens at the hearing? And who makes the decision? Of course, no two custody cases are exactly alike and the law can change. There's no certain way to predict how your case might be handled. And this video is meant to provide basic information which should not be taken as legal advice. We sincerely hope that you and other persons involved in the child custody dispute are able to reach a fair resolution which is in the best interest of the child, whether by negotiation, whether by mediation, or through a court hearing. Many people believe they know a little bit about custody law, and they are quite willing to offer you their opinions. Perhaps your neighbor or cousin has told you that the judge always gives custody to the mother, or fathers always win. Or maybe you were told that a 12-year-old gets to choose where to live. These are examples of street law, which is usually wrong. Every case is different, and what happened to Cousin Jane or your friend Bill might not happen to your case. Let's look at some of the key terms used in custody law. Best interest of the child. This is what judges and custody masters must determine in making a custody decision. It represents all the factors a judge and custody master must consider when making a decision including the circumstances and environment of each parent's household, the child's perspective, work schedules, and many others. Legal custody. This is the right to be informed about and participate in major decisions affecting the child's decision regarding things such as medical, religion, schooling, etc. Most custody orders provide for legal shared custody so that both parents are involved in these major issues. Physical custody. This is the right to have the child without any restrictions or supervision. Sole custody. This is the right for a parent to have the child reside only with them. Primary custody. This is the right for a parent to have the child the majority of the time. Partial custody. This is the right for a parent to have the child some of the time, what most people think of as visitation. Supervised visitation. This is when a parent does not have the right to have visitation of the child unless another individual is present at all times. The supervisor may be a friend, family member, or a professional supervisor approved by the court. It is very important to keep these terms in mind as you watch the video, prepare for your hearing, or attempt to carry out the specific terms of an order or agreement. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Munley. And I'm George Sieg. We are Family Court Masters in Lackawanna County Family Court. In our county, there are two full-time hearing officers called Masters who handle nothing but Family Court matters. We are attorneys who have practiced law for several years before being appointed by the President Judge to handle custody cases and other family court matters. Our purpose is to help the court manage family court caseload more efficiently. In our family court system, there are three levels of custody litigation. The first level is a custody conciliation conference before a custody master. The second level is a custody hearing before a custody master. The third level is a custody trial before a court of common pleas judge. The vast majority of our custody cases are resolved at the first level. Hopefully, after the first level, people do not need to proceed further, but in the event that they need to, they can. There are two purposes of a custody conciliation conference. 
The first is to give the parties an opportunity to reach a formal agreement. It may be that the parties have never been able to sit down and discuss their custody issues and come to an agreement that works for everyone. The custody conference allows that to happen in a safe environment with somebody like myself who handles custody disputes daily. Sometimes it just helps to have someone in the room who can talk about things that a lot of families have trouble with and that need to be written down on paper. The second purpose of a custody conciliation conference is to expedite the process to allow parties to get into court earlier. In the event that there is a custody dispute and the parties are willing to enter into an agreement, the master can do this in a quick and efficient manner. Because the judges have very busy court calendars, a custody matter scheduled before a judge generally takes longer to be heard. Custody masters conduct conferences one entire day per week, currently Tuesday. As a matter of scheduling, it is simply faster and more efficient to dispose of custody cases using a hearing officer. So, what happens to bring parties to a custody conciliation conference? Every custody conciliation conference is the result of someone filing a complaint for custody or a petition to modify custody. A complaint for custody is the document filed in court to start a new custody case. A petition to modify custody is a form that you would file if you wanted to ask the court to change a custody order that is already in existence. The person filing the document has the obligation to pay the filing fee and serve a copy of the papers to the other side by regular and certified mail. You should bring the green card with you to the conference to show proof of service. If you cannot afford the fee, and are of limited income, you may petition the court to have the filing fee waived. If you wish to file a custody petition with the court, you can go to the Lackawanna County Family Center, located at 200 Adams Avenue in downtown Scranton. What happens at a custody conciliation conference? First, the party should arrive early and check in at the family court administrator's office. In the event that a party fails to appear, the master will determine how to proceed. Each of the parties will have an opportunity to speak, but only one at a time and only in order. The objective of the Custody Conciliation Conference is to resolve any and all custody issues, including, but not limited to, time sharing, holiday and vacation schedules, or transportation. The court has the ability to determine whether certain interventions may be necessary, such as counseling or drug and alcohol evaluation. What should you say at a custody conciliation conference? You should say what you want to happen to your child and have a plan in mind that you can express with detail. You need to be willing to compromise and, above all, think of your child's well-being. Do you need an attorney for the Custody Conciliation Conference? The simple answer is no. You are not required to have an attorney. In fact, you are probably watching this video because you have decided not to have an attorney or you cannot afford one. However, if you want to have legal representation, you can. People have many questions about custody law, how a custody proceeding will happen, and what information is most important to present to the court. A professional can help you by explaining these things, but it is not required that you have an attorney. What happens after a custody conciliation conference? The parties hopefully come to an agreement and resolve all custody issues, and the agreement is made into an order of court. That would be best. In the event that an agreement cannot be reached by the parties, a custody hearing before the master may be scheduled where the issue concerns partial custody or visitation. A more formal hearing is held where testimony is taken and the master makes a decision regarding custody. The master's decision is in the form of a recommendation to the court. Generally, this recommendation will serve as an interim order for the parties to follow until it is made into a formal order of court. If one or both of the parties disagree with the master's recommendation, they have the opportunity to file exceptions. These exceptions are reviewed by the judge 
and a determination is made. Previously, it was mentioned that the court may order interventions, such as counseling. The court may also order the case to have an, appoint, an attorney appointed on behalf of the child, called the guardian ad litem. The guardian ad litem is an attorney appointed for the child to advocate for the child's best interest in a custody case. The guardian ad litem is required to reach an independent conclusion regarding the best interest of the child and may, in appropriate cases, consider the preferences of the child. The guardian serves as an officer of the court and shall have the authority and accountability in the proceedings as the court deems appropriate. The guardian ad litem is not a judge. The guardian ad litem is not able to issue orders, but rather makes recommendations to the court as the guardian deems in the best interest of the child. The court may also order, or the parties may agree to attend, mediation to resolve the disputes. Mediation is a procedure where the parties sit down with a trained mediator and attempt to resolve their custody dispute themselves. The first three sessions are free of charge, and in most matters are settled within that time. Mediation is completely confidential, and anything said in mediation cannot be used in a court proceeding. The only thing that is reported back to the court is the results of the mediation, whether an agreement has been reached or not. If the mediation is successful, there is an informal agreement called a Memorandum of Understanding, produced and given to the parties to have their attorneys review. If they are unrepresented, it is the responsibility of the parties to have the agreement made into an order of court. If the mediation is unsuccessful, it is the responsibility of the parties to petition the court for another conciliation conference. Now that we have explained the first two levels of the custody process, Judge Moyle will discuss the third level of custody litigation, a custody trial before the Court of Common Pleas. Hello, I'm Judge Margaret Bizignani Moyle. I'm a judge here in Lackawanna County and I am currently assigned to the Family Court. This video is designed to help you better understand what is involved in a custody dispute and understand how a court decides a custody case. There are many reasons you should try very hard to avoid a custody battle and to try and reach an agreement with the other parent on matters of custody. First of all, a custody case is an emotionally charged proceeding. It can be damaging emotionally to children and to you as the parent. Whenever I talk to children involved in a custody case, the children almost always tell me they wish their parents wouldn't fight over custody. A child always loves both parents and hates more than anything being part of a custody battle. A child who goes through a custody case is often very much hurt by the process and you as a parent will be injured as well. It is a very difficult emotional experience. Another reason that it is good to resolve a custody dispute by agreement instead of going to court is that when you come to court with your custody case, you give up control over the outcome. It will be the judge who decides what the custody arrangements will be. In addition, a judge has the power to impose conditions with respect to custody. For example, I can require that a person or parents not consume alcohol while they have custody of their children. I can require parents to attend parenting classes, anger management classes, and counseling programs. I can prohibit a parent from having contact with certain persons in the presence of their child. I can require that visits or periods of custody be supervised or that they occur in certain locations. There are many other restrictions that I can impose, some of which may not be acceptable to you. I am going to base my custody decision on what I see to be the best interest of the child. I cannot know your child better than you do, and if a parent really searches his or her heart about what is best for the child, you as the parents really know much better than I what is the right decision. Furthermore, a reason to try and work out custody before you come to court is that a custody battle can be complicated and expensive. 
The law says you can represent yourself. You're not required to have an attorney, but you could be at a significant disadvantage if you do not have an attorney. The law also says there are no special rules for persons who represent themselves. An individual appearing on his or her own behalf in a custody case is bound by the same rules of evidence that apply to an attorney. And I as the judge must be impartial. I cannot help you present your case if you don't have an attorney. If you do have an attorney, then you must be prepared to spend significant amounts of money. Another reason to work out custody instead of coming to court is that a custody decision is never really final until the child turns 18. You can go through all the expense and emotional wrangle of a custody dispute and have it last only for a few months. Because your life may change, your child's life may change, and it may be necessary to come back to court. There are procedures to modify a custody order, but it may involve starting the hearing proceedings all over again. And so all of the effort and time that you expended and all of the expense may be for nothing. If you do end up in court, one of the questions you may have is, well, what are the things that guide a judge in making a custody decision? Let me outline some of those factors for you. The law says that if both parents are fit, they both have a right to be involved in raising their children. A court will not severely limit another parent's rights of custody except under the most extreme circumstances. I believe very strongly that both parents must have generous amounts of time with their children. And I see no parent as being preferred unless there are specific reasons that a parent should be limited in his or her custody rights. A child has a right to know both parents. Many parents unfortunately confuse their own best interests and needs with those of their children. My decision on custody is going to be based on what I see to be the best interest of the children, not the parents. A second misconception or legal principle that will guide me is that no special preference is given to a parent simply because of his or her sex. A mother isn't preferred, a father isn't preferred. Both mothers and fathers stand on equal footing before the court. A third factor to keep in mind is that I will give serious consideration to a child's preference for custody provided the child is old enough to have a solid actual basis for that preference. There is a myth circulating around that I hear all the time from parents that when a child reaches a certain age, 13, 14, he or she is then entitled to determine custody. That is not the law. Until a child is 18, until he or she is an adult, it is the court that decides custody, and the child's preference does not control it. It may be a factor, but it is not the controlling factor. In addition, there is a legal principle that siblings should be kept together under the same roof. That is to say, a court has to have very strong reasons to split up custody of children and award primary custody of one child to one parent and primary custody of another child to another parent. So you can expect that whatever custody decision is made, the children are usually going to be kept together. The court will also give very, very serious consideration to which parent is more likely to foster access for the children to the other parent. If I perceive that a particular parent is interfering with custody of the other parent, is being difficult, uncooperative, is criticizing the other parent in front of the child, and doing everything in his or her power to drive a wedge between or alienate the child and the other parent, that's going to be a factor that may very well result in the other parent, the parent who's being more cooperative and more generous, 
being the one to have primary custody. That's a very important factor. Another principle that is of importance to a court is that a parent's right to custody is not connected to a parent's duty to pay child support. I know many of you out there watching this video have problems perhaps with collecting child support or you have a parent who is not paying child support in a timely way. The law says that the right of support, the duty to pay support, is independent of a right of custody. Children have a right to know both parents regardless of what the support arrangements are. Now, as I've said in the beginning, you are always better off trying to resolve custody disputes without coming to court. Even if you're able to resolve only a piece of your custody dispute, let's say, for example, you're able to work out the schedule for the weekend or the regular weekday, but you're having difficulty in figuring out what to do for the holidays, you can bring the narrow issues of the holiday custody to court and present the court with your agreement on the other aspect of custody. That's perfectly acceptable and it's preferable. The more you can work out about custody, the better. Even if you are at a point where you are having difficulty resolving your custody arrangements, but you think that there is a basis on which you might do it if you had some help, there is help short of bringing your case to court. We can provide you with other opportunities for settlement, such as mediation. We sincerely hope that this custody video will help you to decide to do what is best for you and your children. Of course, the information contained in this video must be quite general in nature and must not be considered to be legal advice. Every case is different and we cannot predict how your case will turn out.